let's get it on and enjoy the rest of the day, hopefully. They said it's going to be easier with every minute and every hour. It's quite the opposite, I would say. So it's going to be a struggle, especially for, my, for me. You, ju you can just enjoy yourself and watch some PowerPoint slides. So uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce myself because I know that I usually do not strike people as the most reliable person at first sight. So my name is Patrick. I've been like the hardcore and semi-hardcore gamer for the last 25 years or so, starting with Atari 65 XE, then Amiga 500 Plus, bunch of consoles and other things. Now I tend to mix everything all together whenever I find time to play, actually. And believe me, I do find time to play, so that's good. At the same time, I've been a part of advertising industry for the last 12 years or so, working for Grey Group, Ogilvy, Hypermedia, Isobar, now being a strategic consultant for Dentsu Aegis Media. And at some point in my life, oh, Yesterday, I had a brilliant idea to make that legal and use a legitimate photo, but at some point I forgot to do that. So please meet Shutterstock. Yeah, so, but the whole idea behind that photo is that at some point I wanted to merge and decide to merge those two worlds, being, being advertising and gaming industry. And I joined 11-bit studio and we worked together on this War of Mine, and Anomaly, Franchise, and a few other things. Right now, I'm a, officially, I'm a part of the team, and we do, when, when we do awesome stuff together. But all of that, so that advertising experience and game industry experience gave me quite unique perspective, I would say, on what's going on here, because on one hand, I can see the whole marketing thing from the gamer's perspective, and on the other hand, I can see the marketing thing of, from, from the other perspective or something. So, long story short, there is a tension, especially when it comes to game dev. There is a tension between creators and advertisers and media guys and people who promote games and who shape games into products because with all the respect possible, games are products. The best kind of products, of course, because we love them and they are so fucking awesome. But still, games are products and they, as products, games have to compete on the market. And that market is a very competitive one right now. So it's a challenge and it's a challenge we have to face every day. So I would say that internal marketing department at every company is a kind of a necessary evil and we are treated like that from time to time and I understand that to some degree especially after I have seen the latest Call of Duty trailer but still I think that this evil you have to cope with that evil because we are more and more needed right now because of the whole, whole communication clutter on the, mar on the market and so on and so on. But to the point. So gaming industry is huge right now, right? So you've got huge amount of money, huge amount of investors, huge amount of products on the market. And as you can see, this data is about 2018 or so. It's a prediction, but quite accurate, I would say. You can see that PC gaming is going to be huge and other subsectors are going to be huge as well. Maybe not handheld gaming, but whatever, and everyone play games. Youngsters, older people, generally everyone is a gamer to some degree. So the best idea ever is to create your own game, hit the market, earn huge amount of money because you've got great game, you've got great idea be behind it, and you are sure about that, right? Hell yeah, brother. So is that enough? I wouldn't say so because at the end of the day, it's not about you knowing that your game is good. It's about your consumer, your gamer, knowing that your game is good enough to buy it and then to share the experience with other people. So the question is, do your potential consumers know that your game is good? 
And how many of them know that? And is that number enough for you to earn money, to cover your expenses, and to have something to invest later on and create new product that is going to be more awesome and more innovative and so on and so on? And if this awareness has been established on the market, how to convert that awareness and that knowledge into a purchase process? How to sell your product? How to reach your consumer in the most efficient way possible? So let's get to the boring part, right? Let's imagine you've got a well-defined group of gamers on the market. It's about 2 billion people worldwide right now, more or less. Let's stick to that number. So how many gamers are there? More or less 2 billion, 2 billion of them. How many of them are dedicated enough to search for your game, to search for new content, to browse through huge amount of products that are hitting the market every freaking day? Then how many of them are actually paying for games? So they do have money. They like to spend money on games. They do not use like backup copies and so on and so on. And how many of them own the right platform? You've got a PC game, a mobile game, a console game, whatever. How many of those people own the platform that you want to use as a platform for your product? And then last but not least, how many of them like the kind of a game that you have just produced? And this and only this is your group. Congratulations. Meet your perfect consumer. Is that number big enough to cover, as I said before, to cover your expenses and give you satisfying revenue at the end of the day? If so, you're good to go. That's clear. But if not, you're going to have a problem. In, and is it worth it risking it? You should think about how to reach a bigger, bigger amount of people and how to create a, an efficient and effective backup plan, if that makes sense, to stay on the market and to be able to produce new games and to promote those new games and to enhance your business for the next year or so or a few years or a few decades even. But you can say, wait a minute. We live in a world of social media, right? So my current consumers will share the experience, create word of mouth, I'm going to be viral, and it's going to be awesome because Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and a whole other bunch of stuff that is so very hyped right now. So I'm good to go because of that only, right? So uh, Old Spice guy taught us that you can be on a horse and sit backwards and still earn a huge amount of money. But the thing is that you may be partially true because yes, social media is huge and you can and you should use social media as a part of your marketing strategy, but it won't be enough. Not anymore. A few years back maybe, but not right now. Because let's get back to the data. Right now, you can earn some organic reach with your consumers and with your not paid activities, if that makes sense. But it's going to be about 14 to 18 percent of the whole amount of people that you can reach generally. Because over 70 percent of your reach and over 70 percent of your effectiveness is directly connected to paid media, to the investment. You have to put your money in in the right way just to withdraw something, have some efficient effect. So, because that's how social media work right now. It's not an, a people media anymore. It's a regular type of media. You have to plan media, you have to create the budgeting, budgeting for that, and it has to be created in the best way possible. So you have to earn a valuable reach, you have to build your awareness, you have to make Product, make people know about, you, about your product. You have to convince them that your game is the perfect thing for them right now, right here. And then you have to provide them with the purchase possibility in the most efficient way possible because otherwise they will download your game or do other stuff, use a, another game because it's going to be cheaper, 
and easier to get and whatever. So it's very, very hard. And you've got huge amount of factors you have to include. You have to be aware of your passive consumers, active consumers, how the cons transaction is uh, going on, what media to use at what step of your plan, and so on and so on. But that's the bigger topic, I would say. So I'm going to get to the example. I, I've got two examples for you right now. One is the big example, and it's Call of Duty. The second one is much smaller, but interesting I, as well, I would say. So Call of Duty. It's not a story of an underdog, I would say. We, know, we all know that Call of Duty is a huge success and has been a huge success for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. so. But even starting with Modern Warfare, which redefined FPS genre at some point, and then Black Ops, Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops 2, every next game was the biggest, biggest uh, success selling-wise and budgeting-wise and so on and so on. But still, Modern Warfare 3 had its bar very, very high, and at the same time, the market um, situation was, was kind of a difficult one because there were some additional factors that marketers and publishers had to uh, be aware of. First of all, financial crisis hit the market, so people spent less on entertainment as a whole. There was a competition growing and Battlefield 3 leading the charge. And there was a polarized uh, perception of the franchise itself. So, of course, there were some fans of Call of Duty and they were playing every another game that uh, has been published within the series. But at the same time, there was a much bigger group of consumers. Let's call them FPS dilettantes. And they weren't playing Call of Duty just because they thought that this franchise, this game is not for them. Because the entry threshold is too high. Because they do not want to get pounded. They do not want to go there, uh, spend their money, and then lose every game because there are some pro players that will own the game every freaking time. So they had their strategy laid down and they were communicating that there is a soldier in all of us, but they wanted to make that strategy and make, make that statement appealing to both groups, being core gamers that love Call of Duty and newbies that were afraid to join in and to enjoy the franchise as well. So they created this new approach, this new version of, present, of, of current strategy, and they wanted to tell all the people, all the potential consumers, that the fun is in always progressing. That you don't have, have to be the best gamer in the world to join the world of Call of Duty. You just have to have fun in the process, right? So they created the whole campaign, which was called The Vet and the Noob, or The Noob and the Vet. And they created all the TV spots, all the mm, uh, social media activities, all the print uh, and outdoor advert uh, advertisement commercials and so on and so on and so on. And they were showing their consumers that even as a noob, you can enjoy the franchise because with time, you're going to get there. You're going to be better. You're going to enjoy it more and more. And because of that, with every playthrough, with every game, with every, section, with every session, Call of Duty is going to be more and more your franchise. And you're going to be a part of a larger community. And that worked brilliantly. Here you can see kind of a media matrix that they used to communicate the franchise. They used to reach new consumers and to convince new consumers that Call of Duty can be the next big thing for them as well. And they had huge budget there. So let's be honest about that. You've got all the media covered just because it's a huge franchise and there's a huge amount of money behind it. But you don't have to always use that kind of budget. It's about the idea, it's about your objectives and how to meet your objectives in the best way possible. And they did that because we all know that there are huge earnings, huge revenue behind that franchise and they were, allowed, they were able to earn $400 million in the first 24 hours, but that's not important right now. What's most important for us are those two data below, because they made some 
after campaign media research and that, mis that research proved that their communication convinced new consumers, convinced new gamers that Call of Duty can be a game for them as well. So they were able to achieve something new that none of the previous entries in the, in the franchise, in the series, uh, was able to achieve. And what's crucial here from my point of view is that the game itself didn't change that much. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 wasn't very different from Call of Duty Modern Warfare Part 2. It was mainly the same game, especially from the perspective of a newbie. It's the same kind of an FPS, it's a fast-paced ga fast game with a lot of shooting, jumping, running, whatever. But because of the different approach in terms of the communication, they were able with the same kind of game to reach new kind of consumer and to convince that consumer that he should try their game. And that, that, that is what we can achieve when we cooperate with marketing guys, those evil marketing guys from your company, from the beginning of the process, of, of the game dev process, and you are exchanging your ideas and you are using your ideas as a foundation for a big marketing plan that will be efficient and effective as well. And the second example, much smaller example, is the example of our own, which is this war of mine. And in, um, in the contrast for Call of Duty, we were an underdog. And in comparison to Call of Duty, we had lower budget, we had growing competition as well, we had no significant track record. I mean, we had Anomaly, uh, Warzone Earth, and the second Anomaly, and a few other but small things, but nothing very, very significant that could establish a strong foundation for us as a game developer who could provide our consumers with something huge, with, with, with something breakthrough. And at the same time, we had the same or more or less the same needs. We were hungry for success. So we kind of knew our game's values and its unique features. And we used that, we used that values and used that features as the foundation for our communication. So we stood in an opposition to current trends and games, showing the war, showing the conflict, like Call of Duty did. So from one and only perspective, through the scope of the, scope of the gun, right? So every game before this war of mine uh, tried to prove you that you have to be a soldier once you're in the conflict and you have to shoot the people and you, you have to all do all those exciting, potentially exciting things. But we wanted to be different and we use that as a foundation for our communica communication because we came up with the idea that in war not everyone is a soldier and we use that to create new trailers, new spots and to spark a discussion, to spark a conversation in social media and the wider scope media just to invite people and to make them care not only about our game but the, about the idea itself and the results were more than, satis more than satisfying uh, especially from our point, point of view because just after the release of the first trailer we got that attention and we got that reach and we were able to spark the conversation and we were able to create a community uh, around our game, not showing a piece of gameplay, not telling about the gaming features, but telling about the idea, T telling about the thing that we want to share with our gamers, with, with our community, telling about war, telling about casualties of war, and as I said before, sparking the discussion. So we built our marketing plan around that, and we were able to gather huge amount of people and to make huge amount of people care before the game actually hit the shelves, the digital shelves in terms of uh, this world of mine. So to sum it up, to, to make the long story short, there is no one recipe for how to be successful in terms of your marketing activities. But there is this one philosophy, I would say, on one approach that is true every freaking time. You have to work as close as possible with your marketing team because 
there is this positive tension between creators and suits. Creators and people's, uh, sorry, and people shaping those games into products. And this, this positive tension can give you huge advantage on the market. It's simple as that. Because cooperating with them, with us, you can shape your game into a very efficient, very attractive product. Of course, knowing your possibilities and limitations and knowing your objectives and how to measure your objectives and how to be adequate to both your game because every marketing campaign, every activity that, uh, is, that aims at promoting your game has to start with your game, has to be true to what your game is about. And to be efficient and to be effective in terms of your marketing activities, you have to know very well what your game is about, what's the big idea behind it, what's the most important and the most valuable, one important and most valuable thing in terms of what your game is about. And you have to be at the same time true and adequate to your gamer, to your consumer. You have to know if he cares about your, about your game and what to do to make him care about your game. How to convince, them, convince him that your game is the thing that he should try right here, right now, for that amount of money that you want to withdraw just because you worked hard on your game. And you have to choose your media right. You don't have to be in every media channel possible, but you have to be in that particular media channels that are valuable and uh, attractive for your end consumers. And last but not least, you have to spend your money wise, but you have to spend it. You want to, okay, that's not the proper uh, thing I wanted to say. You won't do anything efficient without spending some budget on your marketing activity. That's why you probably will need kind of a publisher or advertising team or marketing, marketing team, however you want to call it. That's the thing right now because there is a huge communication platter. There is a huge competition on the market. And even having the best product, you have to prove to your consumers that you have the best product right now. So doing all of those things will repay you and will maybe not guarantee a success, but will increase your chance for success right now. So the last thing I would like to, I would like to tell you right now is to value your internal marketing department. And I especially want to tell you that to my friends from my company, because I'm the part of the marketing de department and I like to be valued. So, yeah, because those marketing guys, well briefed and well equipped by your creatives and by your devs and provided with all the information about your product can pave the road or establish strong foundation for your game before that game will be finished and before that game will hit the market and they can increase your chance for success at the end of the day for your big launch day and they can make your work more successful. Simple as that. Yeah, thank you very much. If you have any questions for me or you would like to discuss something, feel free to do that. Any questions? Anything? Yep. Yep. It's not like other games. You know, I mean, generally, I, there are more good games out there now than there have ever been at any point in time. So just being good is kind of not enough. I'm a journalist, and yeah. I wrote about this war of mine. I wrote about Gone Home. I wrote about Papers, Please. I wrote about 1979, The Revolution. And I wrote about them without even thinking about it because they're not a puzzle platformer. They're not, you know, they're not one of the kind of the very familiar concepts you see again and again. I mean, how important is it to you as someone in marketing that you have that kind of idea to work with? Something that you can't just be put into a bracket so easily. Of course, having um, a unique idea at the beginning of your work is crucial and very helpful, right? But to be honest, I would say that, of course, it's a, I would say, simplified approach. But at the end of the day, 
this war of mine is a kind of a puzzle platformer. I'm, I've, you've got platforming there, and you've got some crafting, and you've got all the elements that you know from other games. The thing is that we knew from the start what's the USP for the game. We knew what's the one big, hip, one big thing behind that game. And when it comes to Gone Home, and Papers, Please, and all the other games, once you can pinpoint the thing that is the most important thing from you, from the marketing perspective, you can build your communication around that. Because it's not important if this war of mine is a puzzle platformer, uh, is it a walking simulator, or a strategy, real-time strategy. It's about casualties of war. Yeah. So no one cares about the mechanics or, or the system. People care about emotions and the experience, right? So I've seen many interesting games yesterday here, but to be honest, almost no one could convince me in a short chit chat that their game is about something. I could see that that game is about something, but even the creator of the game couldn't like, simplify that idea and sell it to me, make a, an efficient pitch elevator. It's a crucial thing when it comes to marketing, you know, because you've got like 10 seconds or 15 seconds or few lines of text just to convince someone that you've got something big for him. And uh, saying big, I don't mean a triple A big budget title. You've got something that is worth his time, right? So I, I would say that every game has something like that. I mean, almost every game has something like that. Maybe not a total copycat, but every, almost every game has something that is wor worth uh, promoting and embracing, but you have to find that, and you, and you have to be aware what kind of, an, what, what element of your game is that particular element that is going to, to enhance your game and to bring it to, your, to, to, to the people. Right? I mean, if I may just follow up just quickly on, yeah, on sure. that point. So, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, in Gone Home in particular, that they got the idea from that for, from playing Fallout 3. Yeah. And just like going into a place, picking up objects, and they thought, well, what can we do with that? Like, so yep. it's a familiar idea, but the one thing that unites all of those games, really, is that they're not pursuing like a conventional idea of games having to be fun in that exact way, right? Yep. And that's refreshing, because 95% of all games are about having fun, whereas these are about kind of learning something, realizing something, understanding an issue, you know, Gone Home does it for a very personal story. Yours is more a kind of a political social story, but, but these aren't topics that I think a lot of game developers feel comfortable with. I mean, should, should game developers be braver about that stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean that gaming and games as a, as a part of modern pop culture are like books and movies and all the other things. They do not have to be a pure entertainment. They have to be entertaining because you play them to, to have fun, but you can have some bigger idea behind it. And our, for example, and by our, I mean 11-bit studios approach is to create meaningful games. Of course, we want our games to be fun, but first of all, we want them to say something, to be about something, not about putting a ball on a ball and creating a line of balls and then getting a high score. But to, we want to use valuable insights. We want to strike people with some new thoughts. And I would say that games can do that right now much, much better than any other media just because they do not only tell the story, they let you to um, experience the story and to co-create the story along the way. And that's fucking brilliant, you know? That's absolutely brilliant. Because to that point, you could do that with few books maybe, which were partly interactive, but right now games give you huge amount of possibilities to not only tell that you have something to tell, but to allow your end consumers to experience what you have to tell and to discover it on their own. Yep. Thanks very much. Any other? No, not really. So thank you very much. Have a great day today. And Enjoy. Thank you.